Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Darnell Perkins, and I'm a board member of the Worthington Chamber Orchestra. And it is my great privilege to be able to introduce our conductor and music director, Antoine T. Clark. But before I do that, I want to thank the St. John's AME Church community and Dr. Ruth Locke for welcoming us here. And at this point in time, I would like to... <coughs> Ashley, would you like to welcome to the welcome? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. It is cold outside, but warm in here. And we're so indeed grateful for your presence here on today in uh, this sacred place. We counted on joy and an honor to have you with us on today. And so we're just looking forward to the presentation. So uh, our home is your home. Uh, relax and enjoy yourself. And we invite you to come back for worship at any time on Sundays at uh, 10 a.m. or any of our ministries that we have. To God be the glory for this day that he has made. Amen. of Dr. Antoine T. Clark, and if I can find it, I just lost it again. Now, the Worthington Chain of Orchestra, formerly the McConnell Art Center Chamber of Orchestra, was founded in, um, it was founded about 15 years ago, I guess I should say, by, by Dr. Ant, uh, Antoine T. Clark. From the very beginning, Dr. Clark has focused the Chamber of Orchestra programming on traditional repertoire, commissioning new music, music education, family-friendly concerts, diversity, and unique collaboration with artists throughout Ohio. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you, because he couldn't be here, to Dr. Clark on film. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Antoine Clark, and I am the Music and Artistic Director of the Worthington Chamber Orchestra. This season is pivotal for the Chamber Orchestra as it further cultivates meaningful relationships between artists, community leaders, and the Worthington community. WCO's programming illustrates my belief that an arts organization should reflect its community and work to bring its diverse elements together. This season's theme, Woven Stories, brings to life the rich tapestry of cultures that define our community. I sincerely hope the Chamber Orchestra and you become closer as we highlight the diverse stories of groups and individuals in Worthington and Central Ohio. Today, local artists and community leaders will discuss their work in the arts, music, and community and share how their identity has influenced their work and life experiences. You will hear their philosophy on diversity and inclusion in the arts and learn of their challenges and how they overcame them. You will also learn about African Americans who lived in Worthington during the 19th and early 20th centuries. The destructive practice of redlining that affected blacks in Worthington and throughout the nation and the present-day challenges in Worthington surrounding diversity and inclusion as articulated by our community leaders. Today's Community Connect event is a precursor to our American Stories of Hope program on February 4th at Worthington United Methodist Church. This program highlights themes in the African American experience and the power of hope in overcoming oppression and challenges. It will feature the art of nationally acclaimed fiber artist Cynthia Lockhart, Professor Emerita of the University of Cincinnati, and the music of black composers Jesse Montgomery, Dr. Mark Lomax II, and William Grant Still. While Worthington's historical connection to the African American experience and openness to blacks in the 1800s is a source of inspiration for this program. I know from experience that there is still a great deal of progress to be made 
and that the current challenges surrounding diversity and inclusion throughout the nation can only be addressed through coming together and sharing our stories. I am grateful to Reverend Dr. Ruth Locke and the St. John AME Church community for your hospitality and for welcoming us into your home. I hope today's collaboration begins a beautiful relationship between the St. John AME community and the Worthington Chamber Orchestra. I am thankful to Kate Lamont, Dr. Jennifer Hamburg, Dr. Mark Lomax II, Professor Emerita Cynthia Lockhart, Toya Spencer, Karen Coleman, and Uccella, the Columbus Cello Quartet, for supporting me in my commitment to fostering an inclusive community in and around the Chamber Orchestra. Thank you all for your time. I hope you enjoy today's insightful program, and I would love to see you at Worthington United Methodist Church on February 4th for American Stories of Hope. Became a state 
um, in 1803, but this, of course, did not equate to equal treatment. In 1804, Ohio enacted black laws that um, required certification of any black living in Ohio to prove their freedom. They were required to pay bonds of $500 from two men, and then those laws were strengthened in 1807. They regulated marriage, prevented gun ownership, couldn't serve on a jury, couldn't serve in the military, couldn't testify against whites, and those laws lasted until 1849. Um, so then the next family we'll look at is the Lee family. And um, in 1830, the Worthington, well, Sharon Township census shows that there were 300 residents in all of Sharon Township. Worthington was actually only the west half of Sharon Township, um, but our numbers, we have to look at the whole uh, township. And out of those 313 were listed as colored. So that was about 4% of the population uh, in Worthington at that time was African American. Um, Benjamin and Nancy Lee were among those 13 people that lived, and we know they lived in Worthington. Benjamin Lee actually was brought to Ohio by a person who he was enslaved to in the South. The uncle wanted to give him to someone who lived in a central college area, but because that wasn't possible, he was indentured until age 21, and then after his indenture expired, he moved from the Westerville area to Worthington. Um, he is notable um, in this particular instance for two things. He was um, listed, it's listed in the cemetery records for St. John's Episcopal Cemetery, which was the main burying ground at that time, that two infant children were buried in the cemetery, so that shows us that the cemetery was open to all community members. But also in the sexton notes, um, they listed that one of the children was attended to by Kingsley Ray. Um, and Dr. Kingsley Ray lived in the house on the village green that you might still recognize. So he was seeing patients um, and treating African Americans in early work. Um, one more time. And also, this kind of got a little high up there, but uh, Benjamin Lee was listed in the 1881 uh, newspaper uh, that he was the oldest resident of Worthington at that time and was seriously ill. So they did feel um, compelled to report on that, but also used the term Uncle Ben Lee. And um, historically, uncle and aunt have been used as a derogatory term of endearment, used by whites to address older um, unrelated blacks rather than calling them Mr. or Mrs. So that's a clue when you see things that you know that uh, the reporting on African American. All right. Next thing we'll chat really quickly about is the Anti-Slavery Society, which was formed in 1835 in Worthington. It was one of the earliest chapters of the Anti-Slavery Society to be formed in Ohio. 66 people signed the Constitution which is notable when you consider there were about 350 people at the time in Burlington. But then digging into those numbers a little further, 45 of them were men and 24 were women. And one family included eight of their children who signed. So, well, at the beginning, 66 out of 300 feels like that was a head of household for each house. That's really significant. But it was a smaller slice of the population of Burlington and then Interestingly, many of the families moved to Iowa that signed that within the next five years. So, you know, I don't have record as to why, but um, it does kind of change how I view the anti-slavery society. Um, Ansel Matute, oh, here's the objective of the National Anti-Slavery Society, the emancipation of the colored man from the oppression of public sentiment and unjust laws and the elevation of both the enslaved and free blacks to an intellectual and moral equality with whites. And then the notes below from a Worthington meeting where they pledged to not support any politician who didn't support um, equal rights for all people. Okay, so then Anthony was one of the founding members of the Anti-Slavery Society. He lived right on North Street where there's now a gas station at the corner of North and High. And his house has been moved. Um, so you may recognize it now, it's kind of behind the Dairy Queen. Um, but he was a wagon maker, and he um, would have reason to be delivering wagons and moving things. And a um, 
he was also a blacksmith, so he would transport people heading north on the Underground Railroad. And he would often take people to the home of Ozum Gardner, which was up, still standing on Flint Road. And um, that's the Ozum Gardner house. And let's see, that's some good notes on that, but anyhow. Uh, so he, Ozum Gardner is credited with uh, helping at least 200 people to freedom. There's a little um, that's still behind the creek back there where they would conceal people, he would feed them, and then um, help transport them up Allen Creek to Eden in Delaware or over to Westerville where they would continue north. Um, and he and Ansel Mattoon are both referred to a lot in the um, papers of Wil Wilbur Henry Siebert. In the 1890s, he started a project to collect stories of firsthand accounts of people who were either were somehow directly involved in the Underground Railroad. So quite a few people refer to both Ansel Mattoon and Ozum Gardner and their work in Worthington. All right, so then Henry and Alter, they are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, because they were formerly enslaved in Virginia and came to Worthington in 1838 and uh, purchased a house on New England Avenue, uh, and Dolly's obituary really tells their story, that Aunt Dolly Turk, an estimable colored lady of this place, was interred at the cemetery last Sunday. She was a formerly a slave in the state of Virginia, where in the year 1838 she was purchased by her husband, Harry Turk, and they immediately came to Worthington, where she has resided up to the time of her death. Our citizens remember her as a good and kind-hearted woman. And um, so we don't, no, if they lived in this house in 1838, but probably they did, and were renting, and then officially bought the house in 1856, which puts them, for a long time it was thought they were the first African Americans to buy their own home. Um, recently I found out that Mrs. Farabee might have bought a house a little bit earlier than them in 1855, but uh, having the opportunity to buy land, own homes uh, in 1850 in Worthington was um, they definitely did have that opportunity. Okay. Where is that house? That house is on New England Avenue. Um, just if you're like West New England Avenue, a block down past the Worthington. Okay, so then Uriah Heath in the Morris edition, and I could talk about this topic for an hour, so I'm going to try to stick, keep on topic here. Uh, Uriah was a Methodist minister. And he advocated for the freeing of enslaved people. He helped raise funds for the establishment of Wilberforce College, which is the nation's oldest private historically black university, owned and operated by African Americans. He was also an agent um, of the Track Society for the Methodist Conference, and he often discussed concerns that free blacks and Methodist ministers should have a place to call home. So he was instrumental in developing the Morris edition. And there's a picture of him. And he lived right on the village. Let me give it another one there. Yeah. And he developed this neighborhood, neighborhood, the Morris Division, which was the first platted subdivision to be annexed into Worthington. And so State Street up at the top is East Granville Road. And then Olive Street at the bottom is South Street. And it goes from Morning Street over to Andover, with where the Harding property is. Um, and so there were 118 lots, and of those 118 lots in the 1800s, 23 of them, or 18%, were owned by African Americans. And when you consider that the population of Worthington, about 6%, were African American, um, Uriah Heath's goal to have a place where African Americans could buy land to build homes seemed to be working. And then, um, Hopefully many of you knew or got to attend. We had the uh, Barker dedication in October. On the other side, um, featuring St. John and the church, the historic church, and then this side for the Morris edition, right there on Plymouth Street. Okay. All right, so uh, last family we're gonna chat about is the Scott family. And um, Worthington was a stopping place for free blacks leading the South before the Civil War. Uh, and continued to be so after as well. 
James and Harriet Scott were emancipated in Virginia, and um, there are records of them talking about walking to Worthington from after their emancipation. Uh, and they ended up purchasing land in the Morris Edition, um, and then they built a house, and then eventually their son, who was four when they were emancipated, built a house that's still standing. And so you may not recognize it from this view, the back was what was built first in 1880, and then the front was built in 1895, and it looks like this at the corner of Plymouth and Granville Road. Bev Scott, there's the son who got to Worthington when he was four, uh, grew up here, he became a barber, he ran his barber shop out of that house on Morning Street, and then eventually, um, yeah, so this is a picture of High Street, oh, yeah, one more time, yeah. Um, he built the house with the arrow on the east side of High Street, approximately where the Whitney house is now, around 1890. And he was mentioned in the newspaper often for working with other businessmen in Worthington to try to improve the streets, to try to improve the sidewalks, showing up in village council meeting minutes, uh, showing up in the newspaper for all the work he was doing for Worthington. Um, and so, you know, finding out that, when trying to learn his story and then finding out that he built this building, which isn't there anymore, was kind of really exciting for me, that there were black businesses right on High Street in the 1800s. Okay, and then um, he was buried, he and his family were buried in Walnut Grove Cemetery, uh, or some of his family members. Um, and so I just threw this in because Walnut Grove in 1904, the notes, the trustee notes, is one of the few places where it's documented that Worthington, Worthington decided to segregate something, and they reserved the section on Maple Alley specifically for African Americans, and they weren't to be buried any place else. And that is one of the earlier records um, of segregation. All right. Okay, and so the last thing which I'm going to mention, and this could be another whole hour-long topic, so um, if you want to learn more about it, I can definitely share more resources. But, um, so we've seen that there were African Americans in Worthington, not um, in great numbers, but they were locum, they were buying land, buying homes. Uh, and then in the 1920s, um, the federal government, in order to uh, increase home, home ownership in the population in general, started um, some loan programs and insuring mortgages, but part of those programs um, to go, the restriction was that they were not open to African Americans. So they started um, evaluating neighborhoods and what, how safe it was to offer a mortgage, and they deemed it unsafe if there were presence of immigrants or African Americans, and give them grades. So you can see on this map, most of Worthington, if you look at the historic district, three out of four quadrants fall in that B grade, and then the area where Hartford, where the library is, and northeast of that, was graded at a C. And all the blue dots are homes owned by African Americans, the purple dots are homes rented by African Americans, and then the yellow dots are um, home or households that had an African American listed living with them and working as a servant. And when you start to look at where how those dots fall, you see why, potentially why, uh, that northeast court quadrant was graded as C by these people. Uh, who were evaluating the safety of their mortgages. Um, and then what also paired along with this was starting to include, they were required for any new subdivision in Worthington, or not in Worthington, in the country, uh, if they were going to be, the loans were going to be backed, they had to um, re include restrictive covenants in the subdivisions, new subdivisions. And so that's when, after the Depression ends, Worthington starts to grow. We get Colonial Hills, Riverly, and then later um, other neighborhoods that are required by the federal government to include a clause that says that homes are restricted to Caucasians only. And so you start to see how um, Worthington changed, or and communities changed um, as time passed. 
that the growth that was happening was stagnated by people not being able to, uh, African Americans not being able to get loans, not being able to afford mortgages to buy homes in these areas. And then dynamics have shifted, and that's something we're still dealing with today. So I think that, that is, that's a huge topic um, that hopefully I kind of whet your appetites to learn more about if you don't know about it, because uh, it's really interesting. And what we see now, um, when you learn that history, you realize how our community's been shaped so heavily by uh, policies that were made a century ago. So that's where I'm going to leave it for now. And I think some more things will come up in the panel discussion. Yeah. Thank you. sort of gave us a segue back into our, our panel discussion. And I would like to introduce the moderator for that discussion, and it's Dr. Jennifer Hambrick. Dr. Hambrick unites her extensive background in the art and media with her deep roots of Columbus to bring inspiring music to Central Ohio as classical 101 midday host. Hamrick performed with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and the Civic Orchestra of Chicago before earning a PhD degree in musicology from the University, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. As a writer and radio producer, Hamrick has interviewed some of the world's most fascinating people, including Nobel Prize winning authors, Wolf Prize winning mathematicians, and many of the world's foremost classical musicians. Her feature writing has appeared in numerous publications across, across the country, as well as w, on WOSU Radio and OSU.org. And as Gant, garnered uh, national awards, um, award-winning poet. Hamrick is the author of three poetry collections, and her poetry has been honored with multiple nominations in the Postcard Prize. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jennifer. It's a great pleasure to see you all here and an honor to be here. And thank you, Kate, for your uh, tremendous presentation. Um, I'd like to invite our uh, distinguished panelists to come forward and join me up here in the white chairs. Um, I think we're going to have a, an absolutely phenomenal and fascinating conversation with, um, please, <laughs> oh, thank you, um, with our, with our, uh, with our guest panelists, and I will introduce each of them uh, somewhat briefly, please. Um, but please note that in your programs, there is a full bio for each of our panelists, and I highly encourage you uh, to read those bios um, as, as we go along here. Uh, we just heard from Kate Lalonde, who is at the far end. Uh, she, as uh, she mentioned and was introduced, is the uh, executive director of the Worthington Historical Society. Thank you. And actually, I'll move on to that. Yeah. 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 One moment, please. Would you would you mind taking this to the other end? Logistics here. <laughs> Kate Lalonde is the executive director of the uh, Worthington Historical Society. Uh, also on the panel in uh, the middle here is Dr. Mark Lomax. He is the featured composer for the Worthington Chamber Orchestra's second Masterworks concert, which will take place February 4th at 5 p.m. at Worthington United Methodist Church. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. Uh, also on the panel is fiber artist Cynthia Lockhart, who is in the fabulous jacket, uh, almost to the far end. She is our commissioned artist. 
Cynthia was commissioned to create a unique woven tapestry, which is right here to my left, uh, in keeping with the Worthington Chamber Orchestra's theme this season, Woven Stories. And if you haven't uh, yet seen the piece, you see it now, and it is absolutely stunning. Uh, Cynthia will have a chance to maybe tell us a little bit about this piece after the panel discussion. Um, and, um, and, 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 and maybe uh, Edwin will talk, talk a little bit about how this piece can maybe go home with you uh, after the, the concert. So that's an exciting, uh, exciting uh, piece as well. Cynthia Lockhart's artworks, our artworks, excuse me, are in museums and private collections around the country, and it is a great honor to have here. It's a, have her, a great honor to have you here with us, Cynthia, on this panel today. Toya Spencer is yes, <laughs> is also with us. She is the first ever director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Worthington City uh, School District. Uh, and as her biography in your program states, she has extensive experience leading efforts toward inclusion and equity in the corporate world and now also in an educational setting in our school district here in Worthington. It's great to have you on the panel. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we have uh, Karen Coleman, who is a professional with extensive experience in the corporate world, currently serving as the Epic Project Coordinator at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Karen is also a community leader with a deep background in project coordination and planning community events that foster diversity and inclusion. Uh, she served on the board of the Worthington Historical Society and uh, played a pivotal role in planning the dedication of the Ohio Historical Marker uh, at the uh, St. John AME Church, the old St. John AME Church building in Worthington. We just saw a, a photograph of that marker a few minutes ago in Kate's presentation. Uh, and uh, that, that building, by the way, as I understand, uh, the old St. John and the church building is in Worthington's Morris Edition area. So the, the markers, of course, so denoting uh, the, the Morris Edition are a, a sort of key building in, in, the, in the, uh, the, the Morris Edition. So thank you, Karen Coleman, for joining us. Have a seat. <laughs> and please welcome our members. So, um, I, again, I'm really hoping that this will be an incredibly eye-opening and mind-opening conversation and an enriching conversation uh, for all of us. Um, I've prepared some questions for you, and there are door openers um, to, to sort of take the conversation where, where you think it needs to go, based on your experience with the community. Um, you know, I think I'll pick up where you left off, Kate, a little bit and address my first question to you. Um, from your perspective, as a historian of Worthington, um, how have you seen, you know, the, the, the population demographics of Worthington change over the community's more than 200 year history? You sort of were getting into that very, very clearly at the end of your presentation. And I guess more specifically, you know, is, is Worthington at all coming, becoming more diverse? I mean, um, and if so, what are the factors that might be enabling that to happen? Right. So if you look at the population um, demographics over time, you know, in 1830, it was about 1.5% of the population was African American. Uh, and then by 1880, it was about 6%. And that's both if you're looking at Worthington, just Worthington, or Sharon Township. Both were kind of the same at 6%. Um, and then 1920, uh, still hasn't been a tremendous amount of growth, 6.7%, um, about 100 out of 1,620 people. And then that's when this uh, loan situation changed and redlining began. Worthington started growing actually quite a bit. All these neighborhoods started being developed and African Americans were left out of that. So as Worthington's population grew, um, the number of people that were able to stay in their family homes or their fam their children were able to buy homes in the area and stay in the community, um, seemed definitely was affected. And so by 2000, um, you know, between 1920 and 2000, it dropped to back to 1.7%. Um, and now the latest data from the 2020 census was 3.8%. So um, in the past 20 years, the population of African Americans has doubled in Worthington proper but still hasn't recovered since the, uh, you know, the Im impact of redlining and not having access to loans and things like that. 
things like that. Sure. Okay. Right. Um, and, and it's still obviously a quite small percentage, right? Yeah. Uh, Toya Spencer, let me bring you into the conversation. Um, as Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, for the Worthington City Schools, you've been instrumental in formulating a strategic plan for diversity in the Worthington Schools. But you also have a long background of building diversity in the corporate world. So what, in your view, uh, is, I guess I'll, I would say, absolutely foundational uh, to building a culture of inclusion in an organization and, and also in a community? What must a community have, even to just start building a foundation for diversity? Sure. I'm going to, I recorded some notes because I wanted to make sure there were certain things that I covered in that question. Um, so, please laugh. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so things that you must, absolutely must have. Again, this is from my perspective, having... I, I'm uh, sorry, I want to make sure... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, is understanding, first and foremost, the difference between diversity and inclusion. Right? Um, so when you think about diversity, I think diversity happens, right? It, it's passive. All of us are different. You know, some could argue that if you're looking at certain elements of diversity, you could argue one room or a space or an organization or community is more diverse than others. It depends on what you're looking at, right? If you're saying we're looking at race, ethnicity, socioeconomic, um, educational background, okay? But diversity exists because you have people who are different. Inclusion is an intentional process, mm -hmm. right? So that means you're going to do something different that you didn't do before. Um, so that means if you're saying we want to be more accessible, if we, you know, we want to be more uh, equitable in how we present um, opportunities to people and invite people in conversations and processes and organizations in the community, there's intentionality in inclusion and in, in, in creating equitable um, spaces. So for me, there's, that's the difference, right? You can't, we say those words together, but the action um, and the effort behind them are very, very different. Secondly, I would say um, that if a community or an organization wanted to say we wanted to be committed to this work, it requires courage to change. Um, because the easier thing to do is just to, to remain the same, right? Let's just keep things status quo. This feels good. This feels comfortable, right? Feels comfortable for who? For the people who are, right, um, maintaining that status quo. But if we want to do something different and say, we don't want this to remain the way that it is, that takes courage to be able to do that. Um, and then in doing that, you have to... Uh, be open to doing those things different. And a lot of times people don't want to do things different. We want to say, oh, we want you to change, we want you to change. But when it comes to the change and knocking at your door, right, and calling you to maybe um, create spaces for other people at the table, right, or to give up some of your um, blessings or privilege or opportunities to share that with other people, sometimes people don't want to do that. That's a little too close, right? That's a little too much work to ask for me to do. Um, and then finally, there needs to be accountability. So we can say we want to change, we can say we want to do these things, but what are we doing and how are we holding ourselves accountable and holding the people accountable who say they want to change and who say they want to create spaces that are more accountable and more inclusive um, for other people. And again, that can't happen without intentionality, that can't happen with people holding you accountable, putting a plan in place, what are we doing to continuously improve, continuously get better, to continuously challenge, right? Because it's about the continual movement to get better. So for me, those three things have to be in place in order for you to do something different and to, to be better. Even just to begin to, exactly. to, to think, yeah. And then one question that, that immediately comes to my mind is you were saying that we have, we have to hold folks accountable. Who is we? For me, we is the community. Right, it's we, we are we. We are we. <laughs> we are we. We means we. We are we, whoever is investing, whoever cares about this, whoever wants to see something different. Yeah, okay. Um, Karen Coleman. Um, to, to my right. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your viewpoint uh, at this point, I'd like to bring into the conversation. As a member of St. John A. Church and someone who has
has been actively interested in the history of the African American community in Worthington. Could you talk about diversity in Worthington? In your view, you know, is Worthington moving in the right direction? Do we have even some of the foundational elements maybe in place to move in the right direction? Uh, you know, in terms of building a diverse community and in, ter in terms of building, I guess, an inclusive community. Um, given what you just shared with us, Toya Spencer, what indicators do you see kind of in that direction or, or frankly, in, in the wrong direction? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to start by saying that um, I reflect on Proverbs 22.6 on train a child up in the way that they should go and they won't depart from that. Um, my parents were very active in the Worthington community and we had four generations um, all the way back to my great-great-grandmother growing up on Toller Road. Um, Margaret Atlas Tolliver and Jim Tolliver, um, which is now North Street. But to look at the history of the transitions in Worthington, I used to be able to go in and out of every house on Morning Street and it was relatives. That church on Plymouth Road I attended that church. My parents raised or raised up in that church. Um, so to see this, the city of Worthington and to see the changes in, and the, um, the legal aspects of not being able to get loans and things like that, that touched our family very personally. And I didn't find that out until COVID when my brother wrote an essay. And he wrote an essay for his 50th class reunion um, at Yale, and he shared the story about my dad going to the bank. And he was, at the time, Paul was only 11. And he used to caddy for the bank. The banker, my dad was in school with the banker, and at that time was, um, you know, after the niceties were out of the way, um, he was told, Harold, you know, um, we cannot give you a loan without a white man's signature. So this was, you know, my brother is 14 years older than I am. I'm the youngest of five. So to know that history and not know it until COVID hit, and I'm reading his essay and talking to him, and the tears roll because of the, um, the disrespect of, of humanity and, and the redlining, underlying, you know, undefined the red line. Some of the things that affected Worthington at the time. So now, there's no family on Morning Street. If you look at the community going from 6% to 3%, there's a lot of work to be done in, in terms of people loving people and, and embracing people and not saying, oh, this area is less qualified or less valued because a, a person of color lives there. So I, I think, you know, to me, the challenge is there. I, I love Worthington, I love the community, but I don't think people even realize the challenges that we, that our family faced. Um, and even the street, um, they used to call it an alley. Franklin had only five houses on it, and it was the last, one of the last, it, I always say it's the last, but it was one of the last paved streets in Worthington, and my dad went to city council and at the time, they had an outhouse, so this, I missed the outhouse thing. <laughs> but at the time, they had an outhouse, and he went to city council and said, our children are acclimated to these flies, but the same flies that light on you light on those children at the, at the ball diamond. And within months, they paved Franklin Avenue, one street north of 161 in that C section. Yeah. Um, that happened, and I, you know, I think back at that history, and I didn't have negative feelings going through school, but that whole growing up in Worthington, everybody was related. That they were cousins and family, and now they're gone. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a challenge I see as a challenge and an opportunity that truth matters, and um, when you know it, you do better. You have to, because we're all made in God's image. Sure, that's some, some really um, rich and, and fascinating and heartbreaking um, family history there. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's very powerful um, and, and, and very telling, uh, you know. Um, you know, I kind of would love to hear you, Toya, and you, Karen's 
sort of dialogue back and forth a little bit about this this whole idea of picking up where you left off here, you know, it's just this really a bigger question of, of love, how we sort of treat our fellow human beings, you know, regardless of skin color. Um, Toya, for you as, as somebody who is working for the Worthington City Schools to, you know, try to foster an inclusive community within the schools, which is so hugely important because, of course, how we educate the, young, the younger generations is going to sort of have this huge ripple effect, right? Um, how, how, you know, how, how does this piece of just sort of basic respect for, you know, the, that the students may have and may not have for each other kind of play out in, in sort of your, your kind of daily work on the job? I mean, do you yeah. find that? Sure. Um, I love how we talked about love because for me and my job, um, it is my profession, right? I've been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work for about 18 years. So professionally, this is what I do. But I believe what I do and where I am in Worthington City Schools is a moment of purpose for me, right? So it's deeper than that. So when I approach what I do, I lead with love because I believe this is where God has me at this period of time in my life. Um, I do not grow up in Worthington. Um, did not go through Worthington schools, but my husband did. So um, when I hear stories like yours, Karen, um, it's reminiscent of things that I've heard from my husband. He was the first African American captain of his football, of the football team, right? Um, he talked about his experiences growing up in Worthington. While they were positive, he had you know families that loved him, supported him, but they knew he came from he he. Um, Grew up in the inner city and ended up coming to Worthington um, in about fifth grade. They knew his family. He was coming from poverty, right? Um, but for me, I feel like, one, I lead with love. So for me, it doesn't, um, it does not matter to me who I'm engaging with, who I'm talking to, what I want them to feel for me from the beginning is that they feel that love for me. That doesn't mean I'm not going to challenge the organization or the, the school district or our community. It doesn't mean I'm not going to have challenging conversations, but I'm doing those things because first and foremost, we are here to serve children. So if we look at our mission statement in Worthington Schools, it is empower a community of learners who will change the world. And for me, that is every single child. Now, how do we do that? Right? Um, and that's where the challenge lies. Looking at ourselves as a school district and looking at those areas that we may have some disparate impact on certain groups of students more than others, but um, for me, that's what I lead with. So I have a program um, that I go into the um, elementary schools and I'm reading to children and I'm talking to them and we're talking about love and we're talking about being kind and including each other. Um, but when I tell you, when I go into that school and they see me, they know me as Miss Toya, okay? When I walk into that school, every little kid is running up to me saying, Miss Toya, Miss Toya, right? And it doesn't matter um, what color that child is. That's what this is about. That's what that work is about. So um, that's where it starts for me. It starts with um, every child seeing me, and I do think it is important they see me as a black woman in Worthington schools and the position that I am in. Um, I think that's important. I think that's important for white children to see that. I think that's important for black children to see that. Um, and that means something to me and that matters to me. So that is how I lead every single day, right? When I go into the schools, when I'm talking to my colleagues, when I'm talking to community members, um, my hope is that people, when they walk away from me, they feel like they've had an encounter with someone who is leading with love. Sure. And this is, the kids are running up to you saying, I'm Mr. Toya, Ms. Toya, it sounds like they love you. <laughs> I love them. So, I love them, I do. Yeah, yeah, so that's, okay. That, there, there's, a, there's a big glimmer of hope there, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, Toya, Spencer, you're also, your, your, your bio in the program for these events points out that the Worthington School District is racially diverse. 35% of the students in the school district are students of color. But as we were preparing, uh, for this panel discussion, 
you pointed out to me that in addition, that two-thirds of the Worthington School student population pulls from Columbus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what do you think needs to happen? You know, and, and this is sort of like the, the question we all want to know the answer to, Toya. So, what, I mean, what do you think needs to happen in order for the broader community of Worthington itself to become more diverse? And I guess, obviously, that includes sure. schools. Well, I don't know that I have an answer for that, right, to be honest with you, because the school district is a part of the community. So we just talked about, and you heard, the history of what happened in our community. Um, and so I don't know, to be honest with you, that Worthington schools per se can do anything about that. Um, I think uh, that, is a, that is a conversation and a challenge and a task for the community of Worthington. Um, I did not participate in the visioning process in Worthington, but I was hopeful um, and excited to see that part of that process was a conversation about uh, Worthington being a diverse and equitable community. So um, I hope that the community holds the leaders accountable to making that vision being a reality. Um, so, I think for us as a school district, we are already dealing with and living with the diversity um, in, in our school community, right? So I, I don't have an answer for the city, <laughs> for the city of Worthington. I'm, I'm just being honest. Like that is a challenge that I think is beyond me. And to be candid, my focus is how are we serving the community of students that we have currently? Sure. Yeah. sure. And Cynthia Walker. Well. As, as Dr. Antoine Clark mentioned in his video presentation, we're going to hear um, we're going to hear from our artist Cynthia Long and Dr. Mark Lomax um, about frankly your experiences uh, working as uh, artists, as people of color working in the arts. Uh, Cynthia Lockhart, you are a professional fiber artist, uh, and we're asked to create um, this gorgeous new work of fiber art inspired by the uh, woven stories, American stories of hope theme for this. Uh, uh, community Connect and the, the, the concert in a couple of weeks. Um, would you please uh, discuss, you know, kind of how you've developed your artistic voice to reflect your worldview and artistic aesthetic? Uh, and, you know, can, can you speak to how personal identity and being a minority, you know, affects your work? I read that, and I read that, and I read that. <laughs> So I'm going to say it like this. I want to first say that I always feel so comfortable when I'm in the house of God. So everybody's, all the vibes I'm feeling for everyone feels real good. God is the one who chose me to be the artist. Yeah. And he did that through a gentleman, um, Tom Phelps. Um, I have been living in New York, working in New York uh, for many, many years. I, my background is fashion design and so I completed a fashion design degree out of University of Cincinnati, and um, and uh, actually, let's go further. This this will tell you a little bit about me and how I'm thinking about my parents. Um, when I wanted when I when I wanted to go, where do you want to go? The university. The university. I said I want to go to Paris. <laughs> I'm going to be a fashion designer, and I want to go to Paris. That's where I need to be. And so my mom said, well, why don't you fill out an application at Cincinnati? <laughs> <laughs> University of Cincinnati, so I said, oh, okay. So I, I did that application, and I'm still saying, what, 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 what about Paris? Obviously, they said, yes, we want you to come in, we want you to come and uh, be, be at our university. And there was, you know, there was a little help with that as well. And um, I said, well, Mom, I, but I want to go to Paris. She said, okay, why don't we just wait, wait a little bit while longer? So went to University of Cincinnati, ended up in um, uh, graduating, going to New York. So New York is my second place uh, with, with that. This, I'm just trying to say, when I, when I, when I don't look at things like, how do I say this? I, I look at things at what value God has given me. And as, when you're looking at something, you're looking at the, hopefully you're looking at the value that God has given you. But what I do is, I already know that God doesn't just help one segment. God helps all. That's right. 
And that's how that's how I see it. I'm, I'm not gonna when I read it, I, I said, how am I gonna answer her? This? I just want to say, God has put me here, He called me to, to do many things. But one of them was eventually to be an artist. And I didn't exactly understand it, but I accepted it. And every time you accept something that God gives you, you're gonna, you're gonna win on it. Not only are you gonna win, everybody else is gonna win. And, and, and then they're gonna get something out of it. Uh, so becoming an artist was just phenomenal. And, and of, of course, it was, Tom Phelps said to me, we want, I, when I left New York and went back to Cincinnati, I, I joined, I was invited to be on the board of the Arts Consortium there. And um, there were artists hanging out and doing all kinds of wonderful things. I'm a fashion designer, so I mean, you can kind of see. This is not my design, though. This is from, from an artist. Uh, but this is kind of how we look. We, we want to look a little differently. We want to carry ourselves a little differently. That's a part of this whole, um, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? How do you carry yourself? And so I can go back to how maybe African Americans would, would have carried themselves in the Old South, I say to the Old South, I, I, my, my, my grandfather, all things are coming up into my mind now, handled themselves, they were so proud of themselves, how they dressed for Sunday, going, going into the church. The church was the lifeline for black folk because God loved them. If nobody else loved them, excuse me, if white folks didn't love the black folks, God loved the black folks. So all I'm saying, that, yes, that's it. Don't worry your love. That's right, that's right. And don't be scared to love. Don't be scared, don't be afraid. I'm trying to wrap myself around your, 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 your question. But what, what, what happened is, is that Tom, when Tom Phelps called the artist out of me, he said, we, we've been, uh, We've been wondering if you would do a show for us. So I said, okay, I make garments, I, 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 make, I design handbags. And so I said, so what do you want to do? He said, you figure it out. You figure it out. So I, I went, I went to, to God and I said, this sounds really exciting. I want to do this. And I heard, go ahead and do it. And so with that said, I did a collection. My first show, I did a collection and I, showed it at, a, at an art installation, and the people went wild. And they tried to buy my art. And I wasn't ready to sell it. Because I had just become an artist. <laughs> and I had to feel that. So um, you just never know how you tr transcend. Tr tr transcend. You don't know who you're going to meet. You may meet this wonderful woman here. OK, see what I'm saying? You know, there, there, there are folks, now I'm going to say this too, there's some white folks who really want to love on black folks a lot. Right now. <laughs> okay? But because of who we have become, and we haven't gone to that next level yet, you, you, have, to, you have to work with folk who are going to love you back. So that's what I'm saying. It's not a white thing and a black thing. It's a we thing. It's a people thing is that we still haven't figured out how to love on one another. That's right. Please, come on. Yeah, there's, there's the, the theme of love. Please, yeah. come on. please, please. So what I do, I'm trying to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> so what I do with art is I try to get what God has given me in here out so that people can sense and feel and think and go into something introspectively and find out, oh wow, that's, I'm understanding something now. Whether it be if you're in an arts, looking at art, or if you go into a concert and you hear phenomenal music that blows your mind out, or you go to a jazz club and you love on that. We just have to love on each other. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So um, the theme of love coming right back up to the to the top, and um, Sylvia, uh, this question is for you. It's also for you, um, Mark Lomax. As artists of color, have you encountered roadblocks to creating your art? 
And if so, tell us. Uh, so I, I have a lot to say, but to the specific question here, my journey was much different in the sense that I'm a preacher's kid. I grew up playing in the church. I became professional at 12. I started playing in church at six. At six. I started playing at all, drums at two. I started touring at 14. Started recording at 16, playing with the Marcellus at 16, 17. Recorded my first album at 19. I've been fired from five churches because of the art. So when you're raised in an environment that says you're called to do it, and then you go do a thing, that thing you're called to do, and the very people who told you you were called cast you out for doing the thing, what do you do? I've recorded 67 albums, so I did it again and again and again and again, right? I've written over 300 pieces of music. But in following the path and the purpose, I've learned that it's sadly radical in the world for a human being to be humane. It's sadly a radical thing for a human being to be humane. Which is why we have problems loving each other. Because we live in a social, political context in which loving ourselves is a sin against society. You know why? Because if you love yourself, you won't eat bad food that drives the economy. If you love yourself, you won't drink things that hurt your body. If you love yourself, you won't try to soothe yourself by buying material things that give you an external sense of gratification and leave spiritual side of yourself empty. So it's a radical thing to be a human being, let alone to be humane. And that's what my music's about. That's why I'm still in Columbus, Ohio. I work five jobs. And I record four albums a year, and I write a bunch of music, and I get three or four hours of sleep. Because society has not accepted an artist who seeks to help himself and others be their authentic human selves. And so the challenges have been as much racialized, being the only black composer with a doctorate degree in, in Ohio, and working very much with the Cincinnati Symphony, but never with the Columbus Symphony. The mic sucks. Uh, right? And, uh, but um, also being a dedicated person to my family, you know, wanting to be an artist and present at the same time, having values that won't allow me to quote unquote sell my soul to the industry. They, they have been racialized challenges, there have been economic challenges, there have been political challenges, where even black academics, other black composers, black academics, have told me if I didn't write music and tell stories about black history, Africans in America, then I would do much better. Or if I just hired one white person in my band, I could tour all over the world. I've been told that. And so these stories are so important that I would rather be homeless, which I was twice, in order to do the work. I would rather be relegated to obscurity in Columbus, Ohio, which nobody in the world cares about, in order to leave an artistic legacy that hopefully my children can push forth after I make my transition, right? So there, there are challenges, but I think fundamentally the challenge is that none of us are able to be authentically human. And once we can get past that, a lot of the other stuff just falls away. Interesting, very, very interesting. I, now I should. No, I've got the, I've, <laughs> thank you, John. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, I feel like it's probably time to wrap up. Am I, okay, yeah. Uh, so, some some incredibly some incredibly powerful statements here uh, on this panel, and you know the the, the sort of wrap up question that I had planned that I'd love to hear each of you you know kind of talk about was going to be you know before we had this conversation was going to be you know what are things everyone can do to help foster cultures of inclusion in the arts in organizations in schools in communities wherever. And, and I think that 
I think that question is still relevant. But over the course of this conversation, a much bigger issue has surfaced kind of unanimously, and that is this issue of loving each other, of having, of being humane to each other, of having respect for each other, because people have dignity. It's not something you earn, it is something you are born with, every single person. So how, maybe I'd love to just kind of pass this good mic down the road, <laughs> and hear each of you just talk for a few seconds in sum as a sort of closing statement for each of you on this bigger question of, of respect and respecting each other's dignity. And you take it wherever you want to. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I will use our pastor, Dr. Ruth McCann's last comment in that she says we're better together. Yes, yes. So that would be my message to this community, my community. Um, we're better together and we need to work toward loving each other as a community. I would add to that by saying um, each of us have influence, each of us has power, each of us has uh, some degree of privilege and what that looks like. Each of us have been blessed with certain resources or things. And I would say, um, be willing to share that. Be willing to use that to, to create spaces for other people to be included. There's room at the table for all of us. There's enough for all of us to go around. And so um, we're, we're all blessed in that way, blessed to be in this community. And, um, I just think using that to create spaces for others is really a blessing and a gift. So. Uh, to sum up what's in my head, I think we need to shift from I think therefore I am to Ubuntu. I am because you are. Mm -hmm. And because you are, I am. It, it goes back to love. Love for one another. Somebody mentioned that a little bit earlier text, scripture text, do not be afraid to love. Don't, a lot, some of you folks, why, 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 are, why aren't we working with each other? Why don't we respect each other and love each other because you're a, a, a different from a different, we, we're people. Different races, there's different races all over the world. That is what God wanted. Not what you wanted, it's what God wanted. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if we would get down with the pastor, if we would get down with the program, <laughs> and then turn over. When you, when I wake up, yes. number one, when I wake up, I thank him for waking yeah. me up. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Every every day. I, can't, I mean, I didn't do it when I was younger, but now that I'm older <laughs> and, and, and smarter. Yeah. <laughs> I thank him because you don't know if that's going to be the last day yeah. that you wake up. Mm -hmm. And what are my possibilities today, God? Use me, Lord. Use me in a mighty way. And of course, I've, I've been in church for, for years since I was a little girl. I love church. Church is, is everything. Church is God. And we need to act like we know what we should be doing because if you're reading your Bible and interacting with each other, you know better. When you think of people in a certain way that's not appropriate, that goes for white people and for black people also. Okay? So just some simple, simple lessons. Just learn to love one another. And thank God for every day that you wake up. Thanks. So it's really amazing things. It's hard to follow up and at the end here, but um, I guess what I'm struck with and listening to each person share their stories is that, you know, and looking to love one another and find the humanity and be humane is that we need to be curious about people's stories and be willing to share our stories and listen to other people to find a common ground and understanding and treat everyone the way everybody wants to be treated. It's listening and sharing and sharing what other people are doing and creating that community that you want to see. And, and that's it. 
<laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> Pass the mic. Thank you. And that, that is actually a beautiful segue right back into the woven stories theme of the Worthington Chamber Orchestra season uh, and the, the, uh, the woven stories, uh, American stories of hope theme for this event and the concert coming up on February 4th. Um, I would like to thank all of you panelists for being here today and sharing your incredible
or another conductor on the Underground Railroad, and it's time to go. If I sing, wade in the water, wade in the water, children, I'm not talking about going for a swim. And my son might think I'm a really good Christian when we were allowed to be Christians, because British law did not allow Christianity for people who were enslaved. Right? So it was the first great awakening uh, in the early 18th century that allowed enslaved Africans to be Christianized in America. The water was important because if I'm going to run, the dogs are going to chase me. And that water masks my sin. Double entendre. And even in the latter part of the 19th century, post-Civil War, earlier to mid part of the 20th century, blues musicians would sing in language that they're talking about their woman. But really, they might be talking about boss. Because the Ku Klux Klan happened. And Americans' domestic terrorism destroyed our towns mm -hmm. and our wealth. And so we had to sing songs that expressed who we were in that time. But we couldn't sing and say, hey, it's that cat over there that's coming to terrorize us. Because we would be dead. So we had to sing in language that those who were initiated to that culture understood. Double entendre. It's no different than the kids today texting. And they say, LOL. And I'm like, what's LOL? And I Google it, I'm laughing out loud, like, why is that a thing, right? But it's their language. It was our language. So how do we create a language and a politics that is humane? That's what the piece is about. So it starts with a work song. And the rhythm is very straight. Boom. Chack. Boom. Like a chain game. Pow. Right? Work songs were how we not only organized our work, but expressed to each other what the real situation was that we were living through, right? And you have four Negro spirituals that I use to kind of get us to the actual melody of an expression of humanity. I use um, Go Down Moses, Wade in the Water, Did My Lord Deliver Daniel, and one more I can't remember. Oh, Freedom. Thank you. <laughs> I've written like three other pieces of music since I wrote this. Um, and I started with the Negro spiritual because the piece is about transition, transformation, and transcendence. So the spiritual marks the transition. That's why I'm writing with Negro spirituals about freedom. If God delivered Daniel, and show enough God can deliver me freedom. Wade in the water, path to freedom. Right, go down Moses, path to freedom. Right, we as enslaved Africans identify with the Israelites of the Bible, not Israel today, the biblical Hebrews, right, as slaves wanting freedom. Mm -hmm. And so I start there with the spiritual, because that's the music of my people. That's the music I got kicked out of school and everything for. That's the music that the industry didn't want us to record, so we start there, right? That's transformative melody, because my grandmother still sang those songs when I was a kid. Growing up, my father pastored a church in a sundown town called Davidson, North Carolina. If you were caught south of the tracks, even in 1986, yes. he was done. Yes. And I heard the old folks singing those songs. Sunday morning, when they were getting the church ready, Wednesday night prayer meeting, I heard them singing those songs. But we have to, we can't stay there. We have to make this transition. So the piece goes through this transition, and there's a drum and fife kind of thing that signals the Civil War, and a new melody emerges. This is the birth of our humanity. We're not free yet. But once you see something, you can't unsee that thing. Once you understand how powerful it is to be a human being, you can't go back to being less than. And I want us to see who we really are. Instead of dressing, driving, drinking, and dying, we should be living for each other. So this new melody emerges, and it comes together in so many different ways. The cellists all play it in some way, shape, or form. The orchestra plays it, and they hand it back and forth. And it pops up in uh, cool and interesting ways as it evolves until we play it at the end in this big quarter note, and just bah, 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 because I'm trying to drive, them, drive them, the message home that our humanity is up to us. No politicians going to help us do that. 
I'm a preacher's kid, so I don't mean no disrespect. No pastor can do it because they can guide us, but they can't do the work for us. We have to be to ourselves and each other what we have to be to democracy. How many people understand that democracy is not something that's done to us or for us? It's something that we do every day. It's the choice that we make every day. Being human is a choice that we have to make every day. How do we live into not higher ideals, but our higher selves? The, the piece asks this question early, and it seeks to answer it sonically. And it is literally, the answer is just by doing it. That's the piece. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So uh, now I'm going to invite uh, Cynthia Lockhart up here. To, um, how do you take that, this musical idea, this music, and create visual art um, out of all of that? Uh, something I think we're all very interested to, to know. So please explain your process on this. Ooh, that was good. <laughs> This, his music, that, that particular um, selection was phenomenal. And I, I sang, and I, I love when something goes, you know, when it just bends back. And so that's what that, that music did to me. And uh, that's why I said, I'm going to have to go over here to uh, where my baby is. My, my, my piece of art is my baby. And just kind of jump in here a little bit. So, can, I just want to know, can somebody tell me how you feel? Anybody that's looking at this, that's up close. This, this yes. is me when I came to St. John 30 years ago. Do I know you? You might. You, okay, because I was looking across. The, yeah, you look so familiar. Yes. Yes. We live in Blackhound. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So say that again because I was. That was me.
My work doesn't look like a traditional block quilt, which I love. Those, those are phenomenal. Um, God gave me another approach to, to doing the quilts. And it's just life and energy and flow. That's what we do as, as humans. We are flowing all the time. We're creating and we're flowing and we're learning. Um, we're giving. Some of us are taking also. So it's that whole humanness um, that I try to pull out in my artwork. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, your spiral, the spiral of life and what have you. Again, the, how we're how we starting from just that sperm, that sperm, that egg come, comes into who we are. Yeah, any, any question? But try that exercise stuff. It's so good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, especially that, especially the hands. Yes, yes, thank you. Like, yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something, something. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Okay, last um, item on the program. We are going to have some live music being played here. Um, so real quick, this is the Uccelli, um, the cello quartet for um, women cellos here, right here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, you can read all about their, their bio here, um, our, our special connection, they've actually, actually as Mark uh, already mentioned, they've worked together uh, multiple times. Most recently, was it the, the Ten Concerto project, um, is that correct, or? The, 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 ten the, 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 yeah, the Ten Concertos, are right here. <laughs> just mentioned. Um, most recently, you played um, for this, this big project funded by the, the Justin Music yes. Fund, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, which uh, the Johnston uh, Music Fund is a huge supporter of the Worthington Chamber Orchestra as well, so uh, thank you very much to them. The piece you're going to hear, as you see on the program, is written in 2018. Uh, it's part of a different project. Um, so this is just selections from um, Four Women, uh, written in 2018. Um, yeah, so let's, let's let them take it away and we'll talk about that here. Real quick, I, because I don't know what they're going to play, I can tell you about the piece in, in general. Uh, Four Women was the seventh album of the 12 album cycle, and it was at a point in the, so it's three movements, past, called Alkibulon, which is a word we used, Africans used for what's now called Africa, after Leo Africanus, who's not African. The middle part is called Ma'afa, key Swahili term for a Holocaust or great tragedy. And the final uh, third is uh, Uhuru which is a uh, house of term, South Africa, for freedom. So this is in the Ma'afa piece, when we become black, and what does that look like in America? And there is no blackness without black women. Hello. Hello. So Four Women, as a title, is a riff off of the title Four Women by uh, Nina Simone. Mm -hmm. And each movement of the four is a portrait of a different woman in Africa, American history. So it starts with uh, Queen Nzinga, who was, rose to be king. She was the first feminist of present-day Angola. And she defended her people and her land against Portuguese invasion. Successful. They never beat her in battle. Uh, the second is Ida B. Wells, uh, because of how she elevated the narrative of lynching and stories of the South, so people understood what was actually going on. Uh, the third is Angela Davis, whose birthday is coming up. Uh, she's still alive, yep. yep. Angela Davis is the only person to walk into a courtroom with an afro and her fist raised and win. That's right, that's right, yeah. Black women. The last is Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who's a Nigerian writer, and who really helped me understand how feminism is a westernized concept. Because she didn't have it growing up in Nigeria because she was Igbo in Nigeria. Nobody thought of themselves as black, she says, until she came to America and was confronted with this identity that was different. Like I'm sure in Europe, I've been there several times, I've never heard anybody in Europe say white people just because. Because historically it was all as their physiology shifted once they moved north and got cold and all that kind of stuff from Africa, right? So when you're around everybody like you, you don't have to be obvious and say, oh, you're black, because we're all black, or you're white, we're all white. That's not a thing. And so these are constructs that were created. 
And what I wanted to do was not only elevate the conversation about the power of women, particularly African women, whether they're on the continent of Africa or in the Americas, but these other notions of identity. It is through, in, in African traditional con constructs, it is through the matrilineal line that we receive power, status, and identity. So I could not have a piece that was 12 albums, eight and a half hours, without honoring what we call the feminine ashe. And so these wonderful women agreed to work with this really strange guy who was just like, hey, you want to play a piece that's about, you know, this thing for this bigger thing? And they were like, yeah, cool. And I was like, great. So they came to my house, we recorded it, and they put it out, and it's been fantastic. So uh, Cora will tell you what exactly they're going to play, but that's the piece in general. It is such a privilege to work with Mark. Um, uh, so we thought, uh, working a little bit on the uh, Freedom Train, the concerto for four cellos. There's only one other one that we know that's been, ever been written for four cellos. Um, we would play a little bit of uh, Angela Davis and Ida B. Wells. Uh, we do have to tune. The cellos have been sitting uh, quietly and getting a little colder. So, um, but uh, maybe, and then we'll demonstrate just a few little sections. So. You, you understand the brilliance of um, Mark's writing and how sonically he can make things happen. Like we were asking about in the concerto, hey, what's the balance here? What's the most important thing? He said, nothing. You're at a prayer meeting and everyone's praying out loud, pray. You know, just so, and it's all this kind of, whoa, 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 all these lines are mixing and now we understand. He has just, he's, he's an incredible musician. We're so lucky to have him. Should we tune for a second?
so much. We, we will stand up. I will stop. We're all stuck right there. So. <laughs> well, we'd like to just play. We thought that these two of the four women really helped uh, um, appreciate the freedom train that we will be playing. Um, this is Ida B. Wells. I didn't know how many schools were named after Ida B. Wells. I mean, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I was like, wow, this is so cool. Um, again, I don't. Ida B. Wells, totally sassy lady. Oh, sorry. Ida B. Wells, totally, totally sassy lady. I get to be the sassy. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy gets to do the soulful solo again. <laughs> <laughs> Hold uh -oh. on.
I've been asked to sort of open the floor for maybe one or two quick questions for the musicians, for Mark Lomas, for Cynthia Lockhart, for any of our panelists before we then head across the hall here for some refreshments. Any questions? Yes, I got them. Yes. It's interesting. I think you were, this is like four women sitting around talking about stuff. <laughs> and, and the lead, the, 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 the vocalist would change positions. Sometimes way down here you'd be, you'd be singing the, or playing the bass. And it would move up here and then it would go back to you. And sometimes you were all together. You were you came together on the same point. That's why I was in unison. Mm -hmm. And this was New Orleans jazz, right? I don't know. I think that's what it is. He's not. Yeah. No, you right. Other questions? The musicians, the artists, the panelists. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Please join us across, uh, in the, across the hall. Just real quick, thank you to everybody, uh, all of you in the audience here. Um, once again, thank you um, to uh, all, all of our panelists. Uh, we jolly, thank you so much, uh, Mark Lomax and the Lockhart. Uh, we do want to invite um, everybody to join us for refreshment, but before that, real quick, um, a little wrap up from us, uh, Pastor Locke, um, thank you so much for having us all here today. Again, we're so delighted that for you to come and share. It has been amazing from start to finish. And I got so excited when I heard the panelists talk about love. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And I'm so excited, Sister Jean in the back uh, just completed this banner that we're going to be putting up in our church because we're all about love. And she designed it and made it uh, on behalf of our church. And so I thought that was so appropriate and in line with what God would have our community to do, but also our church family to do. And so we love you, we love you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Thank you for being here.